Thank you very much for coming and joining us for the first of our Serum Speaker Series for the 2014-15 school year. I'm Dr. Debbie Budd, president here at Berkeley City College. And before I turn it over to Dr. Peter DeHaan, introducing our guest speaker of the evening, I wanted to say just a few words about our science department and how proud we are of the work we do here for our students. I want to start by thanking our um, department chair, Dr. Barbara Day Roche, for the incredible work. And she was one that originally wrote the grant for the Serum Speaker Series. Welcome to the science seminars. As Debbie Budd basically said, uh, the series are sponsored by the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, CIRM. And um, my colleague, as already uh, Bar uh, Barbara basically said, received a prestigious grant from CIRM. This grant allows um, students in the bio biotechnology program to do paid internships at institutions like UC Berkeley, UCSF, and Cori in the field of stem cell research. Tonight we are joined by Dr. Randy Shekman. Dr. Shekman received last year, last year the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology. Uh, Dr. Shekman is professor in the Department of Molecular and Cell Bi Biology at UC Berkeley and an investigator at the Howard Huge Medical Institute. At Berkeley, he developed a genetic and biological approach to the study of eukaryote membrane trafficking. In addition to the Nobel Prize, Shekman has received numerous honors and prizes and awards, including the Albert Lesker Award and the Louisa Gross Horwitz uh, Prize. He's, he's member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Art and Sciences. Currently, he is editor-in-chief of the open access journal eLife. He is a strong believer of the importance of public research, uh, universities, and public education. So it is with my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Randy Chapman. Well, I'm pleased to be here this evening and to tell you a little bit about myself and uh, about what we've been doing. Uh, I've been at UC Berkeley for 38 years, probably longer than most of you have been alive. Uh, and it's been a great time and I want to share some of that with you. Okay, well, let's begin. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how I got interested in science because that may be um, something that you share, your interests, uh, as you're taking science classes here at Berkeley City College. My interest started when I was a kid growing up in Southern California uh, uh, with a toy microscope that I had. Uh, I learned uh, when I was probably in sixth or seventh grade about the, the magical world in the, in the, uh, at the microscopic level in a drop of pond water. So there was a creek near, near my house and I went and I I scooped up a, a bottle of pond scum and water and I put a drop on a glass slide and I looked at this and I just couldn't believe all this life swimming around uh, just beneath the visible uh, range of your eye. Uh, amazing array of creatures. And so one evening I was talking about this at the dinner table. So uh, I was at the dinner table and I was telling my family about what I saw in the microscope. And uh, my dad said, well, you know, it's just a toy. Really, what could you see in it with a toy? Just, you know, a few dollar toy micro plastic microscope. So I actually, I got really uh, offended at his remarks about this <laughs> being a toy. So I decided to start saving my money to buy a real microscope. And I had a lot of chores. I, um, I mowed lawns. I babysat. Uh, uh, I had a paper route, uh, route in the neighborhood. And I had an envelope that I kept in my closet, and I kept putting money in, but it kept disappearing because my mom <laughs> kept borrowing my money to buy, you know, like groceries. And uh, so I, one day I finished mowing a neighbor's lawn, and I got so upset that I bicycled to the police station, and I told the 
I told the policeman that I was running away from home because my mother was stealing my money and I couldn't get my microscope. <laughs> so, they, uh, so they called my dad over and there was some you know, stern words in a room behind uh, where I was and he came out looking very severe. And, uh, but that, that afternoon, I got this microscope. <laughs> Long Beach. It was $100, my most precious investment in my youth. This was a, you know, it was a student microscope, but a, you know, more serious microscope. And I, I spent my entire junior and uh, high school years in my bedroom looking at all kinds of, all, all sorts of things, blood and, and uh, bacteria and uh, paramecium swimming around, rotifers crawling around on the stage. It was just endlessly fascinating. So um, I, uh, the big moment for me every year uh, was not you know, the weekend football game, but the science fair. Every year there was a cycle of science fair projects, and that's what I invested my entire time in throughout the year. And I uh, eventually did some projects and won some awards, and my, my, um, my greatest moment in high school was when I, when I graduated my senior year uh, I won a fifth place in the high school biology division in California, and I was interviewed on television in Los Angeles by Vin Scully. Anybody ever hear of the name Vin Scully? He's the announcer of the Los Angeles Dodgers. He's been the announcer for, you know, 100 years or so. And uh, that was my great, greatest moment. Well, so I, um, of course, I, the microscope then got put away, and I'll tell you about it later, but it, uh, for, for 40 years or so it collected dust. And uh, I went off to college at UCLA. I was from a middle class family. There was no money to spend on private schools. I never knew anybody who went to a private school. Um, but UCLA was there. And in 1966, when I was a freshman at UCLA, it cost next to nothing. The fees were something like you know, $150 a year for the whole year. Room and board was maybe $800 a year in the student co-op and books were cheap, I could work a summer job and pay for the whole year. That's not possible anymore, and it's much to my regret that that is so. Nonetheless, it was a great opportunity. Uh, the state paid for 80% of the budget of the university at, the, at that time. It's now down uh, in the UC system to about 10%. I had wonderful opportunities and had great teachers and became very interested in, uh, in how molecules cooperate to allow a cell to grow and divide. I was particularly interested in how chromosomes were duplicated, and so I chose to uh, go to Stanford for graduate school where I worked with the, the world's expert on the study of how chromosomes are duplicated, and I learned how uh, to study that problem by breaking cells open and isolating the proteins and enzymes that catalyze the synthesis of DNA in chromosome replication. It was a fundamental process that we could study in bacteria, but which is also shared by, by human cells. I became interested in graduate school in how the cell membrane gets put together. And uh, cells are complicated things. This is a cell that you may not have seen, but I know you all know what it does. Uh, this is a cell in your pancreas called the beta cell. It's involved in manufacturing insulin which is secreted eventually into your bloodstream and is used to allow your peripheral tissues to take up glucose that you produce when you digest food. And the glucose gets uh, swallowed up by lots of cells in your body and it gets stored in a storage form called glycogen, which can be used when you exercise and when you need to produce the currency uh, of the cell, the energy currency of the cell called ATP. Anyway, insulin is manufactured by this particular cell. And the way it's manufactured is it's synthesized inside the cell by, you can't see them here, but by these little, little machines, they're called ribosomes. Ribosomes are the machines that stitch amino acids together one after another to make long protein molecules. Humans have something like 23,000 genes in our chromosomes. And uh, that means that each one of those is making a different protein. And all of those proteins are made inside of a cell. So it's a, it's a massive traffic jam as these proteins are made because some of them, some of them have to be shipped outside of the cell, molecules like insulin. Insulin, insulin is manufactured <clears throat> by ribosomes, just like all other proteins. But then because 
Ultimately, it wants to escape the cell. It doesn't want to stay in the cell, it wants to escape. It has to be encapsulated in these granules. They're called vesicles. Vesicles, as you'll see in a moment, have a membrane that surrounds them that's very similar to the membrane that surrounds the whole cell. And so the logic, as you'll see, is that these vesicles capture insulin and then they deliver insulin in the cell to the cell perimeter and shoot it out of the cell when the vesicle membrane merges with the cell surface membrane. You'll see that as the story develops. Well, the man who really made the most pioneering studies on this process was a brilliant cell biologist by the name of George Pallade, who was uh, also a, a laureate. He won his Nobel Prize in 1974. I had met him when I was a graduate student, and I heard him give his Nobel uh, lecture uh, at a meeting in San Diego. He, um, what he relied on was the fact that all of these membranes in the cell have the same overall structure. This is a, an image, a cartoon, of a biological membrane. The membrane consists of two layers, leaflets, that consist of uh, very hydrophobic, greasy molecules called lipids, in this case phospholipids, and embedded in this uh, ocean of uh, these um, leaflets of, of lipids are membrane proteins. Membrane proteins give each membrane in the cell its kind of personality. There are some proteins that span the membrane and are responsible for delivering small molecules into the cell or out of the cell. There are some proteins that sit on the cell surface and serve as kind of like antennas where they recognize signals, signals like insulin, bind to proteins like this and change the metabolism of the cell. So every membrane has its own personality and the proteins that are in membranes have to be delivered in these uh, vesicles that I showed in the previous image, have to be delivered uh, where they can uh, be deposited into the surface of the cell to allow the cell to get bigger before it divides. All right, well, here's this uh, giant in cell biology by the name of George Pilate. He's no longer alive, but he was a brilliant man, very uh, uh, scholarly in many, many dimensions, really quite a remarkable guy. He's sitting in front of his favorite instrument. This is an electron microscope that allows you to look inside of a cell at very high resolution and to see the membranes that are responsible for this process. So he was able to do, by experiment, uh, the, the, the things that allowed us to, to, to learn how molecules like insulin are manufactured and progress from station to station within the cell before the insulin or other proteins are secreted outside of the cell. So I'm going to give you a little snapshots from his work along the way so that you know uh, how he did this. So here's um, one of his images. Uh, it's of a membrane that I bet many of you have heard of if you've studied biology. It's, all, it's called um, the endoplasmic reticulum. How many of you have heard of the endoplasmic reticulum? Okay, many of you have. So ER for short. It's a good uh, SAT question. Uh, so ER. So the ER in a cell of the pancreas has a very large surface area. It's like a big platform. Uh, and on this platform are these ribosomes. You see these little dots. Actually, Pilate discovered the ribosome by just seeing these dense dots in, in cells in the electron microscope. And he saw in cells of the pancreas that are busy making lots of proteins that get secreted that these ribosomes are poised right on the surface of the membrane. And he could show that these ribosomes were making proteins, stitching amino acids one next to the other, and threading the proteins into this clear space, which is called the lumen of the organelle, the interior of the organelle. So secretory proteins are made on these ribosomes. They pass the membrane at this point, and then they come to rest initially within this clear space. But that's still deep inside of the cell. The, the problem is to get them out of the cell. So the next station in this process is a structure that was found by a 19th century Italian cytologist by the name of Camilla Golgi. Golgi had a way of staining cells with a special dye that enhanced this unusual membrane in nerve cells that was not the ER, but something distinct. And he, it was called the Golgi uh, network or the Golgi apparatus, but its, its role in the cell was completely obscure until Pilate found, by an experiment that I'll 
tell you about in a moment, that uh, it's a station. It's kind of like a bus stop along the path from the ER to the cell exterior. Things pass through this station en route to the cell surface. Well, finally, uh, the granule, you know, that's housing insulin, uh, is pushed up against the cytoplasmic surface of the plasma membrane. Here's the cell membrane, the cell perimeter. And these two membranes touch. They come within a few angstroms of one another, very close. They squeeze out water. And the, the, the junction between these two membranes becomes so tight that the membranes merge. The membrane that surrounds the vesicle merges with the membrane that surrounds the, the cell by a process called membrane fusion. Not nuclear fusion, membrane fusion. Not so, doesn't give off any energy or not much. And uh, when that happens, what's inside of the vesicle now becomes the outside of the cell. It gets expelled to the cell exterior, and this granule dissolves, and the insulin molecules are distributed into the blood, and they go around in your body, and they stimulate glucose uptake, as I indicated earlier. All right, well, here's what Pilate did that was really unique. In, in addition to just inspecting these, um, he was able to deduce that the process that you see in the pancreas is actually the same thing that happens in the brain. So for instance, here is um, a nerve cell. This is the end of a nerve cell, the nerve terminal. In this case, it's a, a, a synaptic membrane that's directly adjacent to a muscle cell. So you know when a nerve cell is activated, it allows muscle cells to contract. That's how you can move around. It all requires that muscle cells uh, are connected to neurons. And the communication between a nerve cell and a muscle cell that allows you to move requires these very same kinds of vesicles. In this case, these vesicles contain chemicals called neurotransmitters, molecules like serotonin that affect mood or dopamine, which is deficient in patients with Parkinson's disease. These vesicles carry these neurotransmitters, and they come up and they, they touch the surface of the nerve cell, and when the nerve cell is stimulated, these vesicles fuse, as I showed you in the previous slide, and the neurotransmitter gets uh, secreted into this gap between the nerve and muscle cell, and then uh, receptors, membrane proteins on the muscle cell, recognize the neurotransmitter, and they fire, and then the muscle cell contracts. Or two nerve cells touch each other, and a nerve uh, impulse is communicated, conducted, uh, from one nerve cell to another in the brain. And this is going on as I'm speaking really billions of times. Even just sitting here listening, it's going on billions of times. All of that is intimately dependent on the same process that allows a molecule like insulin to be secreted. So that was a key insight of Pilates. He also did experiments to show that molecules uh, progress in stages through this pathway. They move through this pathway from one step to the next. So when I learned about this in graduate school and subsequently, uh, it was fascinating. But really, for me, I was trained as a biochemist. I wanted to get in there and understand how this process works. What are the molecules that actually make this whole thing work? And yet, from Pil what Pilates showed, we didn't know any of the molecules that are required for this. We didn't know the cell machinery at all that was necessary to make this process work to make nerve cells work, to, to, to allow insulin to be secreted. The biochemistry, the mechanism of this process was completely unknown. So when I got to Berkeley, I decided to do a little, something a little different. Um, this is not actually 1976 picture of Berkeley, because there are some new buildings, but it serves the purpose. <laughs> I arrived in 1976, and I started my lab. Um, and what I wanted to do was to study how this process works in a simple organism. Uh, so Pilate did all of his work with mice and rats. Uh, and it's very difficult to do molecular experiments of the sort that I wanted to do if you're using a mouse and a rat. So what I decided to do instead was to work on yeast, baker's yeast. Really simple organism. You can grow it up in large quantities. It's all uniform. The cells are identical. And it turns out, as you'll see, even lowly yeast uses the same process to make its own proteins that are 
secreted from the cell as a human cell does. Exactly the same, although, of course, yeast cells don't make insulin. They make their own proteins. They make proteins that allow them to grow on the surface of a grape and then uh, to scavenge carbohydrates, sugars from the grape to allow a yeast cell to grow and ultimately to ferment to make ethanol or whatever it's doing. So um, if you look inside of a yeast cell, as you see here, there are membranes inside the cell. It's a little different than in the pancreatic cell that I showed you before, but there's a, there's a nucleus, there's ER membranes, there's even a Golgi apparatus, and it's particularly evident that there's a Golgi apparatus because of this convenient label, G, that says Golgi. <laughs> uh, but what we, were, what we were interested in when I started my lab was a small group of vesicles that are clustered together under the bud surface of the, of the cell. So yeast cells grow by budding. Uh, the, this portion of the cell is called the daughter cell. And during an hour and a half or two hours of growth on a, on a, a liquid medium, the yeast cell gets bigger, the, the daughter cell gets bigger and bigger, until eventually it approaches the size of the older mother part of the cell, at which point the cells divide in half, and the two cells start all over again, and they make a bud, and the bud grows, et cetera. And this can go on for many, many hours, as long as the cell is happy on a nutrient. So we wanted to know how that happens, how the cell gets bigger. Uh, and we guessed that the cell would get bigger by using vesicles to carry secretory proteins into the cell wall but also that the, we guessed that the membrane of the vesicle would, by fusing with the cell surface, be a building block for the growth of the cell. So we, this was a slightly different prediction about how, this, how the cell worked. The prediction was that secretion and cell expansion or growth would be physically and functionally linked. And if that's true, if that prediction is true, then you expect that the genes that are required to execute this process will be essential for the cell to grow. That is, if you knock the genes out with a mutation, the cell would die. There's no way that it's going to get bigger if it can't do this process. And that was a very simple but uh, profound prediction that allowed us to dissect this process using genetics. But probably the more important thing was that I had a, a really brilliant graduate student, one of my first graduate students, Peter Novick, shown in the lab in a building that's called Barker Hall, just a few blocks away from here. You see, this was the 1970s. He had long hair. <laughs> I, too, had long hair back then. But I, um, but I, I actually, at this point, have more hair than he does. <laughs> He's now a professor at UC San Diego. Anyway, so Novick and I proposed to make mutations in yeast that were going to kill the cell. But of course, if you, if you make a mutation that kills the cell, then of course it doesn't grow. So what do you study? It's a dead cell. So there's a, a very powerful way of doing this in a microorganism. It's called um, a conditional mutation. That is a mutation that cripples the cell at, let's say, human body temperature, 37 degrees centigrade, but which does not cripple the gene at room temperature. And the way this works is that sometimes when you have a protein that's misfolded because of a mutation, a single amino acid is changed so that the protein is not quite right. Sometimes that mutation will produce a protein that works OK at room temperature. But if you warm the cells up to human body temperature, the thermal motions cause the protein to fall apart. And that's under conditions where the normal protein would be perfectly happy. So a special mutation that converts a gene and thus a protein to a thermosensitive form allows you to study the effect of that mutation because you could grow the cells up at room temperature and then simply warm the culture up and watch as the cells die. What happens as the cells die? That's a simple but profound, profoundly important approach. Now, you know, Berkeley being Berkeley, when you propose to kill things, you're the subject of protests, as we were. So here we were, trying to do our work, <laughs> facing <laughs> protests, and the torture in the labs. Yeast have feelings, too. So I had to, I had to persuade the, uh, the authorities that yeast are not uh, thinking, loving, sentient human beings. 
and they, they relented, and we were allowed to kill billions of yeast cells in the course of our work. <laughs> All right, well, so what we did was we started looking for mutations that uh, produce this temperature lethal effect. There are, yeast has 4,500 genes. It's simpler than a human, but it has 4,500 genes. 1,500 of those genes are essential. They're essential for you know, lots of different things. They're genes that are required to make protein. They're genes that are required to replicate chromosomes. And some of them, we guessed, are going to be essential for protein secretion. So we had to find ways of looking among a variety of colonies that showed temperature-sensitive lethal growth. And we found one, after a few months, that caused cells to build up secretory proteins inside the cell. Normally, these enzymes would have been secreted into the cell wall. But in this mutant, the enzymes built up inside the cell. So this was really exciting. And at that time, by chance, in May of 1978, uh, George Pilati, the, the great uh, cell biologist, visited Berkeley for two special lectures. And I had the opportunity to tell him about my work. And he had dinner with the graduate students, including my student Novik. And Novik told him about his work. And then uh, no, Pilati said, well, of, of course, you'll want to look at these cells by electron microscopy, which we were going to do. but Novik raced ahead and did that. And uh, one of the great moments of my life came in the summer of 1978 when Novik called me. I was up on the sixth floor of Barker Hall. He called me down to the electron microscope room in the basement of the building to have a, have a look at what he had discovered. And here was the first mutant. Now, remember that cell I showed you a little bit ago that has just a few little vesicles in the bud and some other membranes in the cell? This guy, when it's uh, incubated at human body temperature for a couple of hours builds up thousands of vesicles, no longer restricted to the bud, but instead spilling over and filling the entire cytoplasmic compartment. A really dramatic effect, uh, uh, you know, one of the most dramatic images short of the birth of my children that I've seen in my life. <laughs> and um, uh, then he could show that when you cool the cells back to room temperature, these vesicles return to the pathway and secrete their content, and the cell is, is happy again. Well, so well, this worked great, and so we published this uh, in 1979. And for the next year and a half, Novik kept repeating the procedure with refinements to isolate more and more of these sorts of mutations. And uh, we found lots of different uh, mutations. A bunch of them, the different genes, showed the same uh, appearance suggesting that there were a number of different genes and thus proteins that were, were required to take this, uh, these vesicles and uh, allow them to fuse with the plasma membrane. In fact, we now know, because we, we know all these genes, that this guy, which we call SEC1, the first secretion mutant, that gene is found in all uh, cells that have a nucleus. And the protein product of that gene is everywhere where a vesicle has to fuse with the plasma membrane of the cell. Even in the nerve terminal, the SEC1 protein is operating right now in your brains to allow synaptic vesicles to fuse and discharge neurotransmitters to allow muscles to move and nerve cells to communicate with one another. There is a unity in biology that uh, is informed by evolution uh, that uh, allows uh, a complicated process that was invented by chance in a lowly microorganism to be used over and over again through eons to the point where it is used now and will continue to be used to uh, allow this process to operate in all of our cells. Well, um, another mutant that we found uh, did this at the, when you warm the cells up. And it built up this huge structure, which we could tell was a Golgi apparatus even when it doesn't have a G. Um, it is an amazing thing that you don't see in a normal cell. It looks just like a Golgi, and that's because this particular gene is required to move things through that station of the cell. We found other mutants that cause a block earlier in the pathway. Uh, they cause this structure, the ER, to become much wider and more dramatic than, this, than, than we normally, uh, normally see in a, in a normal yeast cell. Well, we could put all these pieces together and have a, a kind of a temporal map of the pathway. Here is the pathway circa 1990-91. We isolated genes that are required for this very first step 
They encode a channel protein that allows things to get into the ER. We found a lot of genes that are required for a bi-directional flow of vesicles between the ER and Golgi. All these genes that are required to move a vesicle to the cell surface. Uh, but when we made these discoveries and cloned these genes uh, and sequenced the genes, uh, although we learned that the human genome has the same genes, we didn't really learn what the proteins do. I mean, if you look at the sequence of a, of a gene and a, and a protein that, doesn't, that you don't know what chemistry it catalyzes, the sequence doesn't necessarily tell you what it does. It's just a string of different amino acids. So if you want to discover what a protein does, you have to be able to recreate in the test tube how it actually works and how it works together with other proteins. You have to do what is sort of serious biochemistry. That means breaking the cell open, isolating the molecules, purifying them away from everything else, and then putting them back together uh, like a puzzle to see how they fit together. So I'm going to just give you a very brief little, a little glimpse of how we did that. Uh, one of the things that we did linking uh, genetics to biochemistry was we isolated the vesicles that mediate flow from the ER to the Golgi by manufacturing them in the test tube. We actually purified the gene products that we discovered by genetics by putting them back together in the test tube and could manufacture these vesicles all uh, without cells. We could just do it all biochemically. And when we did that, we discovered, as you'll see in these images, that the vesicles had this kind of fuzzy coat. And it turns out that the proteins that we purified that, a, that pinch a vesicle to make it, do so by coating the membrane. They kind of form a skeleton on the surface of the membrane. And they grab membrane proteins that are supposed to move along the pathway, and they pinch them into vesicles. And we now know, because it's possible to solve the atomic structure of these proteins, that it's a very regular uh, uh, kind of a polyhedral network that is formed by these sec proteins that cooperate to form a cage, a cage that literally <coughs> envelops and pinches a piece of membrane, as, as is depicted here, and gathers in proteins in the membrane that are designed to move along. So it's, uh, we know now a lot about this, and it was all made possible by having the mutants, but then being able to isolate the proteins and study them in the test tube. Well, as we proceeded, uh, it seemed unlikely to me at the time, let's say around 2000, that, uh, that these genes would ever turn up in human disease. Because after all, you know, the, the mutations kill yeast cells. So surely no one, no patient would come into a clinic that had mutations in these genes. But it turns out that in uh, mammals, the genes in yeast, which are present in just one copy each, are duplicated or more. There are multiple copies of these genes. And so there's been, unfortunately, an opportunity for some genetic mischief. Occasionally, a mutation will occur in one copy of the gene. And if that gene happens to be uh, expressed or, or, uh, or um, um, the protein is produced in a particular tissue, that particular tissue may have a deficiency, but the whole body may otherwise be normal. So uh, all of the genes that are required to make vesicles, to pinch them off, to form this skeleton that pinches membranes, all of them in, in, in humans are duplicated. And, and there have been mutations in some of these genes that produce specific diseases. So I'm just going to finish with one particular disease that turned up in this gene that encodes one of the two copies of this gene, SEC23. So we had a call uh, about a dozen years ago from a clinician in Baltimore, Johns Hopkins, who was collaborating with a Saudi colleague in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, who himself had been studying a Bedouin family where, where uh, some of the kids in the family had a rare craniofacial disorder. As you'll see pictures of these kids, their face is kind of misshapen, and uh, they have brittle bones, and the soft spot that you're born with on the top of your head, but which closes within a few months, and these kids never closes. So there was some defect in the ability of the, of the skull to grow and, and, and to be sealed which we were able to actually figure out. So here are the kids, two, two, uh, a brother and sister in this family. They're obviously alive. They are 
they must be secreting insulin and other proteins. But in this case, they have a very specific problem in secreting things like collagen uh, or pr proteins that are involved in bone growth. Um, and so what we did was we got some cells, some skin cells from one of the kids, some skin cells from the parent, one of the carriers, the parent perfectly normal, but a carrier of the disease. And then we compared those cells to just normal skin cells. And we're going to look by cutting a thin slice through those three samples and looking at them in the electron microscope. And so here's what, what, what we saw, which was quite remarkable. So the top panel is a slice through a normal skin cell. And this is the ER, kind of a ragged tubule looking thing. Uh, the parents who have no obvious disease have ER that's a little misshapen, but it obviously works all right. But look at this. The, one of the kids, these skin cells are growing in the laboratory, but there's an obvious defect. Look at how swollen ER is. It's filled with granular material, which we showed is, is largely collagen. So these cells have a real problem not making collagen, but getting it out of the cell to make connective tissue and obviously a defect in bone, bone growth. And we were able to figure this out with some uh, high degree of precision. We were able to figure out exactly what the nature of this mutation in these kids is and what, what, why things go bad. We can't cure the disease, but we understand it to a very high degree of uh, sophistication. And that's now the promise of having invested all this time in yeast doing basic science. We can now see how this work can be applied. Well, um, I was happy to keep doing all this work, but then I got a call about a year ago at 1.40 in the morning here uh, from Stockholm. And uh, a couple months later, um, I uh, was on the stage uh, shaking hands with the King of Sweden, winning the Nobel Prize. And um, I used the opportunity since then to go around and not only talk about my work, but talk about the importance of not only the public investment in, in basic science, which is really been my passion, but also the public investment in your education and, uh, and, and in an effort on my part to enthuse you with uh, the, the fun of doing science. Now you may ask, whatever happened to that microscope? You know, that thing that was really turned me on to science. Well, if, uh, you know, I left home and there were better microscopes at UCLA, so I forgot about this. My parents eventually shipped it up to me when we moved to Berkeley and it sat in uh, in a uh, utility cabinet, cabinet in, my, in my home for uh, 37 years collecting dust until after I got the news about the Nobel Prize, I got an email from the Nobel Museum in Stockholm and they asked all laureates to uh, deliver something to the museum that represents uh, how their interest in science developed. And I thought about it for a day and I thought, oh my God, I've got my microscope in the utility cabinet. So I went down and it was still there I dusted it off, I wrapped it up, and if you ever go to Stockholm, you can see it there at the museum. <laughs> uh, uh, and the, and the, uh, the docent at the museum will even tell you the story about how I ran away from home to get my message. Back. <laughs> Thank you. So the question is, why did we use skin cells? Uh, well, that's because it's easy to, to uh, take a sample of skin cells from a patient. It's much more difficult to go deep into their body and to get uh, you know, skull samples or uh, uh, other. We could have used blood cells, but skin cells are uh, more readily available. They're easier to culture. If you, close, if you take a skin sample, it's easy to, to make a cell culture that will grow and divide in the laboratory. So it's just a and it turned out to be a good thing because, as you saw, those skin cells from the, from the kids have this really profound defect. And other, other tissues in the body may not have, have shown any particular defect. So we, we really lucked out there. Yes, in the back. Oh, um, I was just wondering, visually I was curious, one of the early slides that you showed with the green things coming out of it, it looks like a square. Maybe green things coming out of it. Green things that were coming out of it. It looked like a square, and then they were proteins. Oh, that was yeah. okay. That was a cartoon. Oh, that thing. That okay. was a cartoon of a depiction of a, of a biological member. Okay, because whatever it looks like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the diseases that kids have, do, do the cells that you slice have any connection or same material um, that sperm are made up of, like nails and hair and skin are kind of the same? No. It's like, is it the same or is it something totally different? Uh, well, s sperm cells have to have a process that allows their membrane to form, uh, but by the time a sperm is, uh, is out and moving about, it's, uh, it's not really making any new membrane proteins. It's, it's devoted to one thing, which is to get to its target. And, so if they uh, sliced it the way you talked about slice and slides, would you find the same material? You would find, well, obviously within a sperm you find a nucleus. That's the most important material that the sperm is delivering. But, uh, and you'd find mitochondria, which are the energy powerhouse of the cell because the, the cell needs to make ATP to, to swim around rapidly. But you won't find too many other membranes because by the time a sperm is, is uh, mature, it's not growing anymore. It's not making new membrane protein. It has a sole function to swim rapidly and to deliver its uh, carbon. Like, 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 uh, I, I doubt it. I doubt it. Uh, not this particular disease, um, um, but there. Are, I'm sure there are other diseases that that affect protein secretion that would allow that would prevent a sperm from being produced. Not necessarily preventing a sperm from moving, but it might, but that it might block its a sperm uh, being created in the first place. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. How how quickly does the vessel merge with the membrane of the cell? The question is that in neurons, it seems like they're firing almost yep. instantaneously. Yep. Is it a fast process from the from when the vessel is formed around the protein to the cell membrane, or are they ready already? Yeah, yeah. very good question. There, so here's the, the question is, uh, you know, this has to be really fast. When, you're, when nerve cells are communicating with each other, we're not talking about minutes. We're talking about microseconds. And so what happens is that the, the, uh, the vesicles that, that uh, package neurotransmitters are manufactured in the cell body, and uh, then they're moved up and they bind on the inner surface of the nerve, the synaptic membrane, and they're poised within angstroms of firing, waiting for a signal that allows calcium to flow into the cell, and calcium changes the conformation of a protein that's locked in place and triggers the membranes to explosively fuse with one another. So that has uh, microsecond time resolution. So the fusion reaction itself, which is the thing, the last thing that has to happen before a neurotransmitter is created, can be very fast. And what about the portion leading up to that? Well, that can take some time, because you can take your time you know, making new vesicles and delivering them. It takes you know, less than a minute, but it, 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 it doesn't. So you're making lots of them, and you won't, when, when a nerve fires, it only consumes a very small fraction of them. So you've got a whole sort of pile up of these things, and you're only calling on them a, a few at a time. Thank you. Yes? I saw some pictures of some young people that had a certain chemical poisoning, and it has a little bit of a similarity to yep. that look. So was there possibly some chemical poisoning that created the paralyzing of the cells? So the question is, is uh, was this um, this craniofacial disorder the, the result of some toxin or or, muta or, or genetics? Well, in this case, it's it's pretty pretty certain that it's genetics because uh, because uh, the the Saudi and and, and uh, uh, Johns Hopkins collaborators. Mapped the local <coughs> responsible for the disease and found that it was a very specific mutation in one of the genes that we had discovered in yeast, which is why we got interested in this. And then we manufactured that mutant protein and put it in our test tube reaction. It could show that that mutation it has the same problem in the test tube that it had in the cells uh, that, that we saw in that uh, microgram. So it's I'm pretty sure it's the, because of the genetics. Now, the craniofacial disease that, that was depicted in the images of those two kids is a, there, there are many different kinds of craniofacial disorder. Most, most of them attributable to some genetic lesion. Lots of different genes, when mutated, give that misshapen facial morphology. This one was a slightly unique uh, uh, characteristic, which clued in the clinicians to make it uh, worthwhile to map the locus. Uh, 
And there may be other, other forms of the disease that are the result of toxins, but the ones that I know about are, are genetic. Yes? Um, are you aware of any research being done? You mentioned earlier that the, uh, the disease that those kids have didn't have to care, but do you think there could be an adaptation of a gene therapy, perhaps? For well, so, you know, this is the problem when you have a disease that affects three people. Uh, it's just not enough uh, a reason. It's, too rare. it's, it's just too rare uh, to put a big effort into uh, trying to cure that, that disease. Uh, there are some thoughts that I had about how, you know, that gene that, that's defective in these kids has a copy. There's another copy of the gene. That other copy happens to be uh, involved in making blood cells. So there's another disease that affects the other copy of the gene. Uh, and um, mutations in that other copy produce a genetic form of anemia. So it, but it occurred to me that if you could somehow turn on the expression of that other copy in the bone cells that are going bad in these kids, that you might somehow suppress the disease. So there might be a way of doing it, but you know, with three known patients in the world, uh, you know, there, there, are bigger, there are bigger problems to study if you want to you know, cure diseases. Yes, in the back. How are uh, food additives, uh, how do food additives react with uh, food cells? Food cells? <laughs> I, uh, I'm not sure how to answer your question. Food, um, what, what food additives are you, <coughs> are you referring to? You'll have to be more specific. I don't, uh, I, I, I'm not aware of, of how food, you might ask, are there, toxins in the food supply that, that block secretion, that, have, that can poison the ability of a cell to make insulin. I'm not aware of any, but they may be. You know, um, uh, plants are, uh, through evolution, have learned how to make all kinds of noxious chemicals because they fight off their own infections. And so um, uh, evolution has made very toxic plants. And there are some drugs that are, uh, there are some uh, compounds that plants or f fungi make that actually do block secretion. There's a drug that we use experimentally that's made by a fungus uh, that kills the ability of, uh, of animal cells to secrete proteins. Uh, it's not a fungus that would find its way into the food supply, though, at least not, uh, not deliberately. <coughs> yes? What happens if you leave the vesicle in the cell for too long? Do you get eaten up? Yeah, yeah. So there's a process. So the question is if, if um, if, if, you, if you take that cell that I showed you the picture of, and you leave it at the high temperature for too long, what happens is the cells die, actually. They die, uh, they die of you know, kind of molecular constipation. Because what happens is that the cell is making everything that would normally allow it to expand, but it can't expand. So it just, you can imagine that it, it gets full and then it, cro it, it chokes itself. Now, if you if you allow these vesicles to build up to a little extent, not, not enough to kill the cell, then the cell has a way of coping by swallowing up these vesicles and delivering them to, uh, to the yeast equivalent of the lysosome, an organelle that degrades things. A process called autophagy will take care of things that, that build up unless it builds up to a, you know, a, a, a lethal level. Yes? Hi, um, and first I want to congratulate <laughs> Thank you. And um, I have a question. How do genetically uh, modified organisms affect uh, human cells? Well, that's a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, GMO foods. How many of you know about GMO foods? Yeah. How, how many of you are, are afraid of GMO foods? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, so, um, uh, you know, I, um, I'm, uh, I have very strong views on the subject, uh, and I feel very strongly that uh, genetic engineering has very positive possibilities for uh, agriculture and for, uh, and for human nutrition. Um, there's an example uh, that, that is, I think, particularly important. Uh, there's a genetically modified form of rice called golden rice that's been produced in Southeast Asia uh, where the rice has been genetically engineered to produce vitamin A, which is deficient in the diet, uh, in the rice-based diet of many Asians. And so these, this crop can be grown just as normal. It, it has a golden color. That's the only thing that visually distinguishes it. 
and it is, uh, provides a ready supply of this vitamin that is otherwise missing. Uh, but the uh, industry that has produced this has trouble marketing this because of the fear. I feel an irrational fear of genetic engineering. The genes that produce vitamin A are genes that are found in lots of organisms that we, that we live with. They have simply been borrowed to allow rice to manufacture this essential, essential vitamin. That's the same with all other kinds of genetic engineering. There are efforts to produce things with a very precise technology that is, I think, much safer than plant breeding. Plant breeding, which has been used for thousands of years, uh, introduces hundreds, if not thousands, of genes and uh, random mixtures into newly bred strains. That has the potential to be much more dangerous, it seems to me, than using the precise tools of genetic engineering to introduce a very specific gene for, us in, for an essential purpose. So I'm obviously sanguine about the prospects of using that kind of genetic engineering to help feed us ultimately a starving world, to make agriculture more productive, and to produce and to supplement uh, agriculture in region, regions that otherwise uh, are deficient. So, uh, you know, you have to test it out. You have to make something and test it out rigorously. Uh, but there is no evidence anywhere that uh, any of these genetically mo modified crops have, uh, have damaging effects. No evidence whatsoever. It's pure fear that, pe that keeps these things from being adopted. Yes? Uh, could you artificially stimulate protein secretion? That's what I'm talking about. Uh, and uh, uh, since, uh, uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, um, well, I mentioned one thought was, was to try to replace the, the defective gene with its copy by expressing it in the, in the cells that are deficient. Um, these cells uh, are kind of stupid. They just, you know, they just keep secreting. They're just, you know, they're one-track mind. Secrete, secrete, secrete. Uh, there's, so there's no regulating control of secretion. But in, and in, in most of the cells of our body, there is a very rigid regulation of secretion. So for instance, in the cells of the pancreas that make insulin, when you're um, uh, sort of resting and you're, you don't have a meal, that cell makes more and more insulin and it stores it in these granules. And uh, it's housed there until you start to have some meal. And then when sugar rushes into your blood, that triggers the cell to secrete insulin. So it's poised, it's ready to go, just like a nerve cell. A nerve cell that has a neurotransmitter is ready to go, poised, ready to be secreted. In that case, it's a, it's a nerve impulse that, that triggers secretion. So there are lots of controls. And maybe if there are diseases of secretion, that, that these controls could be overcome. But um, it would have to be with a disease that has a you know, real impact that, that where it would be justify it big expense to try to study that. But it is possible. So you know, actually, well, there are lots of ways of controlling secretion. Natural, usually natural ways. Metabolic control of secretion. Yes? What is responsible for the cell and vesicle membrane to reform after the protein? What, to reform? Okay, so um, uh, when this vesicle is, is touching the inside of the plasma membrane, it's poised, ready to discharge. It, there's actually never a breach in the barrier. The membranes merge quite naturally and remain continuous. There's never a break that lets any, anything out of the cell. It happens without a rupture. Uh, that's really important. Now, on the other hand, it turns out that cells can, uh, can heal themselves at the, at the molecular level. If you take um, a layer of cells on a, on a Petri plate and you scrape the cells with a needle, some of the cells actually have scar, have, you know, you tear the cells. Now, if you, if you tear it in half, the cell dies. But if it's just a, a minor tear, uh, the, the cell can actually hold the, 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 the membrane together close enough so that it can heal itself by mobilizing vesicles from inside the cell that, that fuse at that location, at the, at the rupture, and, and heal the wound, sort of like, you know, at a, uh, at a microscopic level, uh, you can watch over a very short period of time as, the, as, a, as, a, as a tear in the cell membrane repairs itself. So cells are pretty versatile in that respect. But the normal secretion process goes on without any breach in the, uh, in the barrier of the plasma membrane.
Yes. Um, so you mentioned that uh, when, even though you know the DNA sequence of the protein, you don't necessarily know what it does. Right. Um, so you have to kind of recreate that in a test tube. Right. Um, how does that exactly work? Because don't you have to account for every kind of possible situation that could go on in that? So. Well, um, uh, you have to you have to have a way when you break the cell open of isolating the protein that you want that you know of. And when you have a mutation in the gene, that provides you with tools, molecular tools, that allow you to uh, identify the, the protein. You know, if you break a cell open, there are thousands of different proteins, and you know, how do you know which one is the one you want to study? Well, when you have a mutation in that gene, you can use that fact to clone the gene, and then you can put a tag on the cloned gene that allows you, it's kind of like a molecular hook that allows you to fish that protein out of a crude extract of thousands of other proteins. So that's really one of the big advantages of, of having a genetic approach to begin with. It provides you with a, with a, uh, a crutch, really, to kind of pull the things out that are specifically involved. And when you do that, then you can take them in isolation, put them back together, and see how they work. And, and we, we did that. And we saw when we put all these proteins together that we knew were involved in making vesicles in, in cells. And when we put them back together in the test tube, we could actually make vesicles from an isolated membrane. That's the, that's the power of biochemistry. Yes? Can you briefly explain the cellular mechanics of cancer? The <laughs> uh, question can I briefly explain the cellular mechanics of cancer? The answer is no. <laughs> Not briefly. I, I, can, I, can, I can hear this, the, you know, the, the, the elevator talk. Uh, which is, um, so uh, the cells in your body are, you know, you're, you're roughly an adult. The, most of the cells in your body are not re reproducing themselves. Your blood cells are. but most of the cells in your body are, are differentiated. They're, they're doing what they're you know, in your brain. They're, you know, they're grown up and they're, they're doing their thing. <clears throat> now, what, and, and the way that happens in all of those differentiated cells is that um, the program that they used when they were early and young and, and just dividing turns off. The program that allows it to set, uh, tells, tells the cell, OK, it's time to divide again, that is turned off. And what cancer does is, in, unfortunately, in many different ways, it reverses the block and allows the cell to per continue to progress and to grow and divide. And so a, a cancer cell, for, for many different reasons, is no longer subject to that kind of control. And therefore, it goes wild and just grows in, and can makes a tumor, and then the tumor can send out cells to different tissues in your body and populate other, other organs and, and create metastatic cancer. That, that's, that's the simple version. The, the, the truth is it's very complex. There are hundreds of different kinds of cancers. And unfortunately, many different ways that a cell can lose that control. And, and so if you want to cure cancer, it, it, the strategy, which is really tough, is to identify all those different means by which it loses that control. They're usually genetic uh, mutations and then try to find a way to correct that lesion by producing a drug that blocks the, the, uh, the mutant protein. And that's, that's really tough. Yes? What's your um, hopes for areas of research in medicine regarding like cell membrane disease and actions like muscular dystrophy yeah. and Parkinson's? Yeah. Well, um, Let's talk about Parkinson's. I unfortunately know too much about it because my wife has Parkinson's, so uh, I've been following that for many years. Parkinson's is a disease uh, of a very small, really a small portion of your brain called the substantia nigra. It's a small region in the midbrain uh, consisting of cells that make the neurotransmitter dopamine. And Parkinson's is characterized by a progressive uh, accelerated death of those cells as the, as the patient grows older these cells die. This happens in all of us, unfortunately. These cells are dying. But it's not until roughly half of them are gone that you notice anything's bad, anything's wrong. But in Parkinson patients, that happens more quickly, and so they develop symptoms. And the, the, the neurotransmitter dopamine is involved in all kinds of things, muscle movement and um, coordination. And uh, so patients who suffer from, from that disease have lots of different problems. Now, the disease can be treated um, quite effectively by replacing dopamine with a chemical substitute. But when you swallow a pill, 
that contains that chemical substitute, it's not being delivered to the tissues of your brain in the same way that it is when it's manufactured you know, in the substantia nigra. So, so it doesn't really work. So there are lots of other drugs that patients take. There are neurosurgical procedures that help with the movement aspects of the disease. But unfortunately, inevitably, the disease progresses, and very often it takes it takes its form in, in dementia, much like Alzheimer's disease. So, what's the prospect? That, you know, in a way, there's there would be a simple way if we knew why those cells die in, in a part of why they why they're dying more rapidly than than the rest of us. If we knew that why they died, and there are probably many different reasons for that. Some genetic, others maybe environmental then if we could somehow intervene to preserve those cells, to keep them alive longer, to keep them from going into the program where they die, we could arrest the progression of the disease. So a patient you know, comes to the clinic with early symptoms of, of Parkinson's, if that progressive death of those cells could be arrested right then and there, then it would be a perfectly manageable disease that people would barely notice. So, so to me, what, what we really need to do is to figure out why those cells are gone. To, one way to do that is to reproduce that process in the laboratory, to, to grow these dopaminergic neurons in the laboratory, to take them in some, somehow from Parkinson patients and to see if, if you can observe that difference in the laboratory, one dying more than the other, and then you know, try different chemicals to see if you can preserve those cells. So there's a way to go about it. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, for most Parkinson patients, it's it's a long way off. Yeah, one last question. <laughs> Could you please briefly tell me how the during your surgery the anesthesiologist put the patient to sleep? Can you briefly explain that? Yeah, okay, well I'm not I'm not I I caution I'm not a physician. So anesthetic drugs bind to membranes. And there's a thought that they uh, insert into membranes and that affects uh, the channel proteins that are responsible for your perception of pain. So um, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, your body contains uh, special channels that allow the uh, sodium ion to penetrate back and forth across the membrane. There are many different channel proteins that do that for sodium, which are controlled by the, the uh, membrane potential, the voltage on them. Now, there's an amazing discovery of a disease, a kind of disease, where patients are missing one specific voltage-gated sodium channel. These patients suffer no pain. They have no pain. They don't understand what pain is. And you'd think that would be great. But unfortunately, when you don't know what pain is, you do stupid things. <laughs> So there was a story of a, of a kid in India who had this rare disease. And he would amuse people by jumping off of buildings. Uh, because, you know, he'd break bones, but he didn't feel anything. So these people tend not to live too long. So anyway, the idea is that anesthetics may act on nerve cells uh, to uh, uh, hope, like, temporarily inactivate channels like that that are responsible for the perception of pain. That's one, one, one thought, my quite distant interpretation of that. Okay, so